thank you very much. Uh, God bless you all, and uh, it is a pleasure uh, to be back with you. I believe it was around November that I was here for the first time uh, and uh, in enjoyed the time with you at that point as well, and uh, so look forward to um, what the Lord has in store for us today, but also just in the life of this congregation in general, um, what God is doing. He's working through pockets of people all throughout the world, and uh, it's a great pleasure to be, to be part of one of those pockets, to work together with local congregation uh, to accomplish his will. Today we're going to um, consider this passage in the book of Colossians, and uh, before we uh, dive into this particular passage, let me offer a, a few preliminary thoughts. Um, first of all, uh, as many of you know, I, uh, for the last 10 years, had been pastoring an AMEC church in Lancaster County, and my focus <clears throat> in my pastoral ministry has always been discipleship. I believe that once a person comes into relationship with Christ, it is important that we understand that there is a process of growth that we are expected to experience, and pretty much that process will not end in this lifetime. And so that has been my focus. I believe that a, a discipled church, a strong church in any nation, in any culture, has a tremendously positive influence and impact on every level, every sphere, every element, every institution of society. And as we reflect upon what is happening today in the United States and in various parts of the world, um, we should have some level of concern. Uh, concern with confidence that if we do what God has called us to do, uh, we can have a nation that is fruitful and productive and and valuable and pleasing in the sight of the Lord, but also concerned that it is, it is very possible for religious deception to settle upon the land and upon a people. And so it is with, with that in mind that, that I offer uh, these words today. The other thing I should say is that I am not a three-point sermon type guy. So um, I one time... One time I, I gave a message, and uh, the guy afterwards told me I, that it was about 12 points. But um, so anyway, re, just bear with me as we basically just evaluate this passage of Scripture. Um, this passage of Scripture, uh, I have a, a larger teaching that is based on this passage of Scripture, which is about a five to six hour teaching. So I'm going to attempt not to give you the whole thing today. <laughs> we'll just touch on uh, the important points and, and try to keep moving. I, I don't think you want to be here listening to me for five or six hours. So Now the, passage, the uh, translation that I'm working with is a New American Standard, so it might be slightly different than the translation that was projected on the wall here. But we start off with this statement. Paul opens this particular portion of, of scripture by saying, for this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you. The question should be asked, what is it that Paul heard of? And the answer to that question is found in verse 4. Paul says in verse 4, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, and the love which you have for all the saints. So essentially what we have is this, that in this first century context, Paul heard that in the city of Colossae, there were a, a group of people who made up a Christian community, a group of people who had experienced conversion to Christ. They had surrendered their hearts and their lives to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and were following him as a manifestation of their love for Christ, 
They were also demonstrating a love for the Christian community, all the saints. Now, we can read words like that and sort of take a lot for granted. We can read them and just sort of keep moving on. But if you pause and reflect upon this idea, that in the first century, experiencing Christian conversion would have been much like becoming a Christian in a Muslim country. It was not a casual affair. The Romans were relatively antagonistic toward Christians, and the Jewish community, imagine if you were a young Jewish person and you stood up in synagogue, and you having believed in your heart, as Paul says in Romans 10, you now confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. You're not going to have a lot of people pat you on your back on the way out of the service saying congratulations. You are going to experience antagonism and aggression consistent with what Jesus taught in his earthly ministry, that if they hated you, or if they hated me, they will hate you also. That to become a Christian was often to set yourself against father, mother, brother, sister, son, or daughter. So when Paul hears that there was a group of people who had become Christians, that was taken very seriously. In many respects, they signed their death certificate. If they were not put to death by either the Romans or the Jews, they were at least excommunicated. They were separated from the community, from family, and were likely to be um, aggressively pursued by both Romans and Jews. So it was a, a, a pretty major step. And so as Paul hears this, he says, we have not ceased to pray for you. They definitely needed Paul's prayers. Now, in our nation, though we have experienced the luxury of a lot of freedom of religion and a lot of freedom of expression, though that is somewhat dwindling, um, we might not totally appreciate the intensity of those ideas, but in many parts of the world they are still experiencing um, persecution and martyrdom in, in very, very serious ways just for becoming a Christian, for becoming a follower of Jesus Christ. So that's kind of the backdrop in a first century context. Paul says, we have not ceased to pray for you. So consequently, what follows as we unfold this passage of scripture, is indicative of the way Paul would have prayed, which is rather impressive as well. Because you remember when Paul wrote to the Corinthians, he said, I pray in the spirit. I also pray with the mind or with understanding. And I believe that this would would be an example of Paul praying with understanding. He is praying through the steps necessary to be experienced in order to become a mature Christian. You know, most people, I know it was true for myself, that when I came to repentance and conversion and stepped into the kingdom of God, I stepped in as a babe in Christ, as a neophyte, as a new believer. And in my case, I did not have a lot of Christian background, a lot of Christian teaching, a lot of Sunday school lessons or sermons under my belt in my mind. I was coming out of a a pagan lifestyle, and it was a new life, a new world. I, I went out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, and I came in as a babe, a newborn. And what do you expect from a newborn? You know, if somebody in your family gives birth, you might look at that newborn baby and everybody thinks they're so cute. You know, oh, look at that baby. Even if they're not, everybody thinks they're cute. But what if you were to come back 20 years later and that person still looked like that? 
you would think that something's wrong. We are not expected to stay babes. We are expected to grow. And in order to grow, we have to proceed in accordance with God's agenda, God's design for growth. And what Paul prays through here is an example of that process, of of what we need to experience in an ongoing fashion. And so Paul says that they have not ceased to pray and ask. Now, what is it that Paul asks? Well, the first thing Paul is asking is this. He says, we ask that you be filled with the knowledge of God's will. Filled with the knowledge of God's will. Now, when I first read this passage of Scripture, the word filled sort of tripped me up a little bit. And I thought to myself, well, nobody can possess or understand all of God's will. That's too much. But then I realized that when Paul uses the word filled, it is a word that is relative in nature. In other words, in my case, when I became a Christian, I had the spiritual and uh, mental capacity for, for truth and for things of God that was about the size of a thimble. You know, a little tiny thing you put on your finger when you're sewing? Okay? So I had a very small capacity. But what did God want with the capacity that I had? He wanted all of it. He wanted it to be filled. So by way of illustration, imagine if you have a little container about this big, and you're at the ocean. And you walk down to the ocean and you dip that container in and you bring it out. Is it filled with ocean? The answer is yes. And, and you're allowed to respond if, if you so choose. <laughs> I, I do a lot of my teaching and stuff in a prison and there's a lot of response. So, <laughs> so anyway, it is filled. But the next question would be, does it have all of the ocean in it? And the answer is no. So keep that illustration in mind because we're going to see what happens to a small filled container if we follow through on the process that we are supposed to follow through on. So that's the first thing Paul prays. He prays that these believers in Colossae be filled to whatever capacity they have with a knowledge of God's will. Now, I want to make a comment on the concept of God's will, and we could talk for a long time about that specific topic, but I want to make mention of two big categories pertaining to God's will. The first category is this. If you go back to the beginning of scripture, back to Genesis, where God describes his experience in creating this universe and in creating planet earth and all the contents of earth and then in creating the human race, God says of human beings that he created us in his likeness and his image, in his image and likeness, he created us male and female. So if you're going to consider the idea of God's will, One of the things we should be very, very um, interested in and, uh, and very much involved in studying and understanding is what is the image and likeness of God? Because it's God's will that human beings reflect the image and likeness of God. That's his created design. That's what he wants. So in the broadest way possible, we can say one major aspect of God's will is that we reflect his image and likeness. Now that requires that we construct an understanding of what that means because uh, 
those words in and of themselves might convey nothing. So we need to study, where do you learn what the image and likeness of God is? Largely right here. Now it's true you can learn through natural theology, you can study God's creation, and it tells you something about the Creator. You can learn through interaction with the Holy Spirit, that's true. But for the most part, the foundation, the basis of what we are going to construct and understand regarding the image and likeness of God is contained in this book. I often teach at a missionary base on the nature and character of God. And one of the questions I will ask at the beginning of the week is, and, and most of these students are, are individuals who were raised in the church. Probably 90% of the students that this mission organization gets were raised in the church. And I will ask the question, how many of you have read from beginning to end your Old Testament? And it is roughly 12% of the students who indicate that they have read the Old Testament. You know, a lot of our preaching, a lot of our teaching focuses on the New Testament, which is fine, but you really don't fully comprehend the New Testament without an understanding of the Old Testament, and most of what God has revealed about himself is contained in the Old Testament. And so I ask the students then, how do you know what God is like if you've not read his revelation of himself to us? Do we just make it up? Do we just go on bits and pieces that we hear here and there? You know, it's very important that we study the Word of God because one tremendous dimension about the will of God is that we reflect the image and likeness of God. And if you think back, Satan knew that was true, so what did he try to convince Eve of? That God was a, a, a God who only wanted himself. He said, God knows that if you eat of that tree, you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. And made it sound like God didn't want her to be like him. But God does. In fact, when, when we read, um, if, if I were to read to you from the, um, Paul's statement in the book of uh, Ephesians, as he writes uh, to the Ephesians, he says, in, after a long uh, statement about not living a life of sin, but, but uh, putting on the new self, and so on and so forth, he says this, that we are to be renewed in the spirit of our mind and put on the new self, which, in the likeness of God, has been created in holiness and righteousness of the truth. So what is God's goal for the Christian, it's that we reflect the likeness of God. So that's a huge part of God's will. And consequently, we need to be focused on that. So that's the will of God in reference to the image of God. But then we also have, again, as a kind of a large category in, in reference to this idea of, of being filled with the knowledge of God's will, God's mission for the church. You understand, God has a goal, a purpose, a target, a destiny that the church is to fulfill. And it's summed up in Jesus' words when he said, in reference to those who follow him, while you are going, and many translations simply said, go, make disciples, but a proper translation would be while you are going. While you are going where? While you are following me. Wherever it is you're going, what are we to do? Make disciples of all the nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit. Teach them to observe all I've commanded. And I will be with you to the end of the age. So that's a huge dimension of God's will. The church is not supposed to just be a body of people who come together for convenient church services and fellowship. 
We come together to equip the saints for the work of ministry. That we might go forth and make disciples of all the nations. What a tremendous, tremendous calling. But that's part of the will of God. Okay? So, again, we could talk about the will of God on other levels and other ways. But they are two very broad categories that we want to keep in mind. <clears throat> Excuse me. So Paul says that we are to be filled with the knowledge of God's will. And then he adds this statement. In all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Now, first of all, it's interesting that so far, Paul has used three different words that relate to mental activity. And let me just back up one step. I mentioned to you that I um, have an, an interest in discipleship, and that's been my focus. And to a great degree, I have found four big categories into which you can put discipleship material. The one category is called change your heart. That is a category which looks into and discusses the idea of repentance and conversion and salvation. What's it mean for a sinner to move from being a sinner to being a follower of Christ, to becoming converted? What is that all about? And that's a heart issue. And when the Bible talks about your heart is really... To be brief, it's essentially talking about what you and I as human beings are committed to supremely. It's not good enough to be committed to religion or be committed to yourself or be committed to making money or committed to success or fame or whatever. And there's a lot of people who are committed. Their ultimate commitment is to one of those kind of things. Predominantly, most human beings are committed to the ultimate purpose of pleasing themselves. That's really the essence of sin. Whether you do it in a religious way or whether you do it in a, a pagan, heathen way, if you're committed to pleasing yourself supremely, that's sin. A lot of people use God to please themselves supremely. Use religion. Use Christianity. So God is looking at the heart. He's looking at our motive. He's looking at our ultimate purpose behind everything we do. And what conversion consists of is when a person who is living to please themselves supremely encounters the reality and the love and the power of God to such a degree that they change their purpose in life. And they no longer live for the purpose of pleasing themselves, but they live for the ultimate purpose of pleasing, serving, loving, honoring, and worshiping the supreme being supremely. That is a very, according to Jesus' words, a very narrow group of people. That's why he said, enter by the narrow path. Many are those who walk upon the path that leads to death. But the, the path that leads to life is narrow and few there are who find it. So change your heart. The, the second category is change your mind. Once we've committed our lives to pleasing God, the basic foundational information we need to fill our minds with is what pleases God. What is he in favor of? What is he against? What does he want me to do? What doesn't he want me to do? I need to have an understanding of that. In fact, you know, when Jesus began to disciple his disciples and prepare them, one of the opening parables he gave was a parable about the importance of understanding. The parable of the seed and the soil. Right? It is those who understand the word of the kingdom who produce fruit. So, Understanding is very important. As Paul just said in Ephesians, as he says in the book of Romans, we are transformed by the renewing of the mind. So that's a big category. We need to think about um, putting together a proper mental construction. The third category is change your life. That means once you understand what God wants, you need to put it into practice. That's when your life really begins to change. That's when you begin to produce 
new fruit. And then the fourth category is called change the world. And that's a category about ministry principles and the mission of the church and, and those kind of things. I say that to say that in this passage you will see that pattern. Because when Paul said we heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, he was basically saying we heard that you repented and converted and now you have a new purpose in life. And that purpose is to serve and love and please and honor God. So there's the heart component. And then what's he pray? Well, now that you have the right heart, I pray that you be filled with knowledge. Because you're not, you, you can't be renewed or uh, transformed without the renewing of your mind. So I pray that you be filled with the knowledge of God's will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. So Paul touches on three categories. Knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. And if we had the time, we could go into a, a little... Uh, excursion about the distinction between the three, but we'll, we'll just continue to proceed. I, I will say this, that um, I, I agree with the New Testament scholar Gordon Fee, who basically says that any time we see the word spiritual used in a context like this, it should be capitalized. It, sh it has reference to knowledge and wisdom brought to us by the Spirit. And so as we walk by the Spirit, we produce the fruits of the Spirit. And so spiritual wisdom and understanding is not just some sort of nebulous thing. It is, it is wisdom and understanding we gain as the Spirit leads us into all truth, reveals the things of Christ to us. So it's spiritual wisdom and understanding on that level. And Paul says, we're praying that you be filled with the knowledge of God's will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Now that sounds, that sounds big enough as it is. For most people, they think, well, that's, that's a mature Christian. But this is the beginning of the process. This is a step toward maturity. And the reason we know that is because the next little phrase Paul uses is, so that... He's saying, there is a reason you need to be filled with the knowledge of God's will. You cannot do the next thing if you don't do the previous thing. And what is it that, is, that we are to experience? So that you may walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. And that basically simply could be summed up in one word. Obedience. Now, you know, we live in an age which has a heritage of resistance on some level toward obedience because many people think obedience is earning your salvation. Obedience should not be seen as earning salvation. Obedience should be seen as a manifestation of faith and love. We are to obey God, not to earn salvation. We are to obey God to manifest, to express the love and respect and honor we have for him and his wisdom and his guidance. Right? Jesus came, it says, that he become the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Jesus said, if you hear these words of mine and act upon them, obey them, you're like a wise man who built his house on the rock. So obedience is very important. But what are we to be obedient to? We can only be obedient to something we know we're supposed to be obedient to. So once I get my heart right with God, I have to work on the process of getting my mind right. Now I would say that, that repentance is a pinnacle, it's a climax being renewed in the spirit of your mind is an ongoing process. How many of you know everything you need to know about the kingdom of God, about the will of God, about the character of God, the nature of God? None of us. So we should be actively filling our minds with as much truth as we possibly can as occasion allows. It's an ongoing thing. 
So we are to be filled with the knowledge of God's will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that we walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. Now here's the thing. Once we do that, it says, the reason we are to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord is to please him. And since that was our purpose, we have now arrived at fulfilling our purpose. And again, I'm only working at this point with a, a portion of truth. An aspect of understanding of the will of God. But God expects me to live up to that level, that dimension, that amount of truth. Of understanding. And that pleases him. You understand? Let me give you an illustration. If I have, if I go over to my granddaughter's, my, my daughter's house, and, and my granddaughter or grandson comes out, they're four or five years old, and they say to me, they call me Granfy, they say, Granfy, I drew you a picture. And the, this little four-year-old hands me a picture, right, drawn on a ripped out piece of paper with a big old crayon, and I look at the picture and I can't even make out what it is. But am I pleased with what that child did? Yes, why? Because it was an expression, an immature, a four-year-old expression of their love for me. They were all thinking about me and consequently in their bedroom drawing me a picture. And so when that four-year-old presents me with a picture I can't even make out, I'm still pleased. But here's the thing. When he's 20 years old, do I want him to bring me the same picture? If as a 20-year-old he brings me the same picture, I have to question whether or not there's something wrong with him. You understand? So as we grow, God doesn't want to see the same expression of love, the same manifestation over and over and over and over and over. When he's 20, 21, 22, I don't want to see a picture I can't understand. I want to see a diploma from Harvard. <laughs> you understand? I want to see growth. I want to see evidence that he's maturing. And as Christians we should be giving such evidence in our relationship with God. And this is where Paul says that when we please him in all respects, that's when we bear fruit. That's indicative of growth. We've produced fruit. We've grown. We've changed. And that's what the Christian life is about. We are to produce fruit for the kingdom. Fruit that is pleasing in the sight of God. Fruit that impacts the world around us. Now, once we've gone through that process, which involves having a right heart, right mind, right behavior, please God, produce fruit. We see that at that point something happens. It says here that we increase in the knowledge of God. Now a couple of things here. Notice that Paul's focus, the focal point, is always God. This is all about God, about knowing God. Why? Because we were created by God, for God. Right? All things were created by him and for him. In him all things hold together, referring to, to Jesus. So our focus should be on God. We were created in his image. So as we learn to reflect his image, we are actually learning to become human beings according to what God designed us to be. Right? Isn't that God's goal? God's goal is that he predetermined that those who become Christians, those who become saints, 
And from my perspective, scripture, scripture doesn't indicate that he predetermined who would become saints, but he predetermined that those who become saints will be conformed to the image of Christ. What's the image of Christ? It's the likeness of God in human form. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So God is working and laboring to conform his people, his saints, to the image of Christ. And we bear fruit, we become more in some area of our lives, in some part of our character. We are more capable of reflecting the image of God in Christ by the Spirit. Okay? And at that point, as we increase, we could say this. Our little container goes from being this big to being that big. We've increased. Now the question is, does the amount of ocean that fills this container fill this container? And the answer is, no. So what do we need to do? We need to go back to the ocean and dip it in and pull it out, filled. We are always, regardless of what size container you are, you know, you might be a coffee mug, you might be a bucket, you might be a bathtub. I don't know what your, your uh, capacity is, but whatever that capacity is, God wants it to be filled. Which I find interesting in the book of Ephesians, again, when he writes about being filled, he says, do not be drunk with wine, for this is a waste, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. And it's interesting because it is in a Greek present continuous tense, which we could translate into English, be continually being filled with the Holy Spirit. So every time we experience growth, we need to continue to seek God. We need to continue to draw upon his provisions and his grace in order to continue to be filled. I think that's what Paul was talking about in Philippians when he said, I am not yet perfect. He meant, I'm still going to continue to grow and continue to be filled. I've not finished that ongoing process. But then isn't it interesting because he says, but as many of us who are perfect, let's press on to the goal. What's he mean by that? He means I am, com- I am perfectly committed to the process even though I know I'm not done the process. And that needs to be our mindset. I remember years ago I was at a men's conference and and one of the guys there said to me, you know, now that my kids are grown and, and I'm retired, I can just sort of cruise into the finish line. And I thought, that is not a Christian mindset. That's not a Christian worldview. When do we get to put it on cruise control? We don't. Bearing fruit in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God. And once again, this increase is in a knowledge of God. You know, we get together as believers, we talk about all kinds of things, but too often, the thing that we don't talk about specifically is God. Who is God? What is God like? What does God think? What's God up to? You know, and it's very easy to slip out of a a religious lifestyle that is focused on God and slip into a religious lifestyle that is focused on man and just produce a religious form of humanism. But the only way we're ever going to continue the process of transformation and, and become equipped to be the people God deserves and desires us us to be as if we grow in our knowledge and understanding of God and then begin to conform our lives around that. 
increasing in the knowledge of God. Now, I'll wrap this up by, by saying this, that as you grow, expect your responsibilities, expect your duties, expect on some level your challenges to grow as well. You know, the eyes of the Lord are going to and fro through all the earth, looking to show himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are pure toward him. God is looking for workers. God is looking, as, as we should understand, for, for laborers to send in the harvest field. And due to the fact that that's usually made up of a remnant, a small portion of people, expect that if you're one of those, God's going to send you out to do something. He's going to give you some work to do. And you're not working to earn your salvation. You're working to advance the will of God, the kingdom of God, the glory of God. The earth is the Lord's and all it contains. And we are here to take it back from an enemy who stole it. Do not expect your popularity to necessarily grow, but expect your responsibility to grow. And so, if your responsibility is going to grow, God, in his wisdom and in his love, will make provisions. His grace is sufficient. So how does his grace appear at that point in our growth? It is that he strengthens us with all power according to his glorious might. There never comes a time in our lives where we can say, oh, you know, I've grown enough now, I don't need God. Or a church. We know how to do it. We can go through the routine. We can do the ritual. We no longer need God. That would be like having a television set, and you say, well, it's working pretty good now. We no longer need to have it plugged in. Once you unplug it from the power source, guess what? It's useless. And God designed us to need an external power source. And so we need to stay plugged into God. And as you are plugged into God, he will see to it that you are strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. I think that's why Paul said, I can do all things. Now, he was talking all things in reference to God's expectations, God's will. He, he wasn't saying, I can fly because I know God. But I can do all that God expects me to do. Why? Because he's the one who strengthens me with all power. It's his glorious might that I rely on. Whenever we stop relying on God, we're in trouble. Whether it's as an individual, a ministry, a church, a nation... You're in trouble. But God will strengthen us as we look to him, as we love him, as we follow him, with all power according to his glorious might. For what reason? For the attaining of steadfastness and, and patience. Steadfastness. You know, ministry is not easy. In a world that's fighting against God, to be one who stands up for God, you need endurance. You need steadfastness. You need patience. You know, I had a young couple who wanted to get involved in, in helping kids whose families had abandoned them. And I said to them, one of the pieces of advice I gave them, I said, if you're doing this to fulfill something in you, don't do it. Because before long, you're going to burn out. You will be disappointed because you're not being patted on the back the way you think you should be patted on the back. You understand, ministry requires endurance, steadfastness, and patience. And God will provide us with the strength and the power that is needed to experience that. And, he, and it ends with this statement joyously giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to share in the inheritance of the saints in light.
That is the essence of real worship. It is when you realize that the creator of the universe, the eternal personal God, triune God, who created all things, who upholds all things, is willing to take your puny little life and do something significant with it. And you look back and you say, praise God. You joyously give thanks. You don't just stand and sing empty words like some might have a tendency to do during a worship service. But there is something deep within us where we realize the significance of what it means to be connected with God. And we give thanks. Humbly, but joyously, that he has qualified us to play a part in this great adventure and mission and picture. Amen? Let's bow in prayer. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. We recognize, God, that on so many levels, we have not ascended to that place that we should have as individuals, as the church, as the body of Christ in this nation and and possibly other nations. But we recognize that you are able with any individual who comes to you, any body of people that comes to you with a, a, a contrite heart, broken heart, in genuine repentance, crying out to you, confessing their sin and looking to you, Lord, you are able to deliver us, you are able to transform us, renew us, reconcile us to yourself, to give us a hope and a vision for doing something other than simply surviving. We can be more than overcomers. And I pray, Lord, that that this body, that the individuals here, that the churches in this area and throughout this nation would once again get a vision for connecting with you, for serving you, for loving you, for honoring you, for worshiping you in spirit and in truth. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you very much. Ooh.